Welcome to the Broken Pie Chart Podcast, episode number 36. I'm your host, Eric Moore, and back with me is Jay Pestercelli. Jay, how are you doing today? Doing great, Derek. Thanks for having me back. All right. Well, I'm glad you could make time for us at the Broken Pie Chart Podcast after the media whirlwind they had last week. You uh, it seemed like every time I turned on, well, or loaded up a website, I know you're on Yahoo, on Bloomberg, so all over the airways, but you made time for us once again. My pleasure, Derek. You always get first billing with me. Of of course, as I, as I should. All right. So today, you know, we talked last time about the hedger's opportunity and hedging. And, you know, one of the things I thought we'd bring it back today is this idea of, look, you could be selling volatility and, and selling volatility to me is an, an emerging asset class. There's a lot to get into here. But I also think, you know, with the strategy that we we employ, uh, there are times we're in cash. And so I'll start off here, Jay, and we can kind of go back and forth. You know, when we look at selling volatility, we actually start to look a little bit about probabilities. And so I sometimes refer to selling options as being in the the option probability game. And to give you an idea of really, you know, think about the bell curve. And if everyone at home, well, if you're driving, don't lift your hands up, have your passenger do this. But, you know, if you had your left hand up here and your right hand up here and you're saying it's this far apart, well, that sort of represents a, a standard deviation range. And to give you an example, you know, if we were doing some probabilities and you were kind of taking a look and seeing where the options market via the prices and via what they are telling us the implied volatility is, we can we can sort of look at some numbers. So let's say when a market has a 15% volatility, which of course is an annualized number, and you do some calculations and the one day expected, uh, you know, one standard deviation is about 0.94%. Uh, you go out to you know 25 days, and the expectation is 4.7 percent. So that's a one standard deviation range. So take your hands and put them out. You switch to a 30 vol, meaning it's double the implied volatility. Meaning the options market is pricing in double the expected move, not necessarily direction, but just move. And those numbers go 1.89 percent, 9.45 percent. Now, by the way, the two standard deviations of each are 9.4 and 18.9. And this gets interesting, Jay, because a lot of times when we set up trades to be short, either put spreads or call spreads, we're sort of in the very high probability area. Uh, but one of the things I want to point out is volatility matters because it really matters for the amount of money we can bring in via selling spreads. That's the premium. And it also informs as to how far away we can be from a current market, meaning how much out of the money. And so I know recently we were in cash for a few weeks, and, and I'll kind of ask you about the benefits of having the flexibility. But you know, generally, I think the implied volatility, I don't want to say it's everything, Jay, but it's, it's a lot in how we form opinions on trades. Yeah. I mean, especially uh, when you are you know, running a strategy that essentially takes advantage of the natural time decay of options. Like the high probability option strategy, right? We know in the example you just gave, the chance of the move shrinks as you have less days that you're assessing, which of course makes sense, right? It's like if you were if you were running, uh, and you know how far can you run in one day versus four days? Probably a lot more in four days. Well, the market works the same way, and so um, if you if you shrink all that in together um, uh, and include that as to you know, why this kind of strategy works. It's really about the chance that the market does something out of the ordinary, right? And the more days that you have, the more chance of the of the event occurring, just because it just happens to be more days out there, right? This is, this is not something that's uh, groundbreaking for everybody to think about. But in the options market, there is this natural decay in the probability of things occurring when you have less uh, time to go. And so that is, you know, I like to think about it as one of the primary ways that we uh, uh, explain the strategy to people is that, hey, the chance of an outsized event goes down with fewer days that you have and with the lower volatility of the underlying that you're using. So time, volatility, bring them together. Those are the things that really, uh, uh, to me, Derek, help define uh, this idea of selling premium for income. And those are all weird investment uh, topics, right? I, I, most people don't think about, you know, volatility as an asset class or a means of investing. People are traditionally taught, 
you buy low, you sell high, or you buy high and sell higher. Well, what are those two? That's how you make money. But in the options market, you could trade this completely different uh, class, which we'll call volatility. And maybe I'll kick it back to you and you know see you know how would you how would you treat this different class in a portfolio? How would you treat it in your pie chart? Yeah, I mean, to me, it, it's always sort of uh, goes from zero percent appropriate to no more than twenty percent. And I think it's it's sort of an interesting piece. You know, we we've sort of kicked around the uh, the sixty forty portfolio and whether that's still appropriate. I think you know maybe we look at something like an eighty percent hedge portfolio and twenty percent short volatility portfolio as sort of maybe the newer pie chart because by selling the volatility, you're selling sort of the excess premium. I mean, let, let's think about the. Uh, the car insurance example that you like to bring up and we brought up last week. Last week we talked about hedging, but really, you know, car insurance companies, they're collecting small premium each and every month. And much like we sell spreads on broad indexes with a lot of stocks in them, uh, the idea is that, you know, a whole lot of stuff would have to happen to be negatively impacted. And that's a simplified way of doing it. But uh, car insurance companies have sort of built this risk model. And, you know, that's essentially what we're doing when we're selling volatility. We're selling premium, uh, much like insurance companies do it. Yep. And, uh, you know, you just, you said something and it, it, it clicked for me, Derek, and we haven't talked about this before, but, you know, when you think about a car insurance company, they are benefiting from selling to a lot of people. And they are making a bet every day that every person that they are insuring doesn't get into an accident on the same day or even the same week, right? That would be their quote unquote black swan event. Yeah, it's possible every one of their drivers hit each other, right? And everybody has an accident. Right. The insurance company isn't prepared to make those kind of payouts. They probably go belly up, right? So the multiple uh, drivers that they're selling to certainly helps uh, fund this. And it's, it's one of the reasons why we use indexes and not single stocks, I bet you were wondering where the heck I was going with this. Um, yeah, no, I knew exactly where you're going, Jay. Yeah, I got somewhere else to go when you're. <laughs> okay, so just so let me let me hit your other point, and which was yeah. uh, uh, we talk about the car insurance thing. If if an insurance company insured a uh, thousand sixteen year old drivers, what would they charge? Well, they would have to charge a lot more than an insurance company that was char- that was insuring a thousand fifty five year old drivers who haven't had an accident in twenty years, right? So risk comes into play. The theory being a 16, 17-year-old driver has a greater chance of an accident because of lack of experience or, you know, who knows what they're going through. And then uh, a 55, 65-year-old <laughs> driver probably has their act together a little more, hopefully, and is a little more astute and has a little more uh, expertise and has probably had some accidents and knows how to avoid them going forward. And so, you know, when you think about which one of those two do you want to insure, um, you know, the way to get yourself to uh well the risk is worth worth the reward is you end up charging more for the one that uh has a greater chance of an accident and that's where probabilities come into play and that's how you know some of the stuff that we do here uh uh that we with this kind of a strategy um uh can make sense right so if it's more volatile you got to get paid more if it's less volatile you're not going to get it get paid as much because the chances of a of an accident are less now i'll kick it back to you on this this uh, would have everybody had an accident at once concept. Yeah, no, no, I, it's uh, it's interesting, and uh, you know we like to use analogies, and I think we've just come up with some new ones uh, by accident. And that's you know, like you said, the implied volatility uh, vis-a-vis the pricing of insurance on a sixteen-year-old brand new driver uh, is going to be much higher, as you said, than than somebody. And so the implied volatility is sort of taking the expected variation uh, in, in results of driving. And as you said, the expectation is there's going to be more accidents, going to be more movement. Uh, and I think to your point as well, you know, we, we do this on broad indexes, broad indexes like the S&P 500, which actually has more than 500 companies in it because of alphabet A and B and other reasons, or the NASDAQ 100 or the Russell 2000, a lot of companies. And so you don't have that single risk. Recently this week, Netflix uh, was in the news and Netflix dropped, I think, 11% after reporting uh, positive earnings, but their subscriber growth uh, didn't hit what analysts thought they would. 
if that's uh, of interest to you, Google it. Uh, we won't spend any more time on uh, uh, the fundamentals of Netflix. But Netflix going into earnings, uh, somebody who, let's say, sold options uh, would have needed to sell them with at least 175% implied probability uh, to be compensated for the 11% risk. In other words, uh, something like Netflix right before earnings was expected to move quite a bit, and the options were priced accordingly. And when somebody is selling options, if something moves higher than you've been compensated for, uh, you can take a loss or vice versa. So uh, Netflix and, you know, Jay, I remember uh, back on on the Zega blog, we wrote an article about how single stock risk, uh, Disney went down 9 or 10% one day in 2015 positive earning report, but said they worried about ESPN subscriber growth. So um, yeah, I mean, it's really the insurance company uh, example. Many drivers, uh, the hope that not everybody crashes on one day, many stocks within indexes, the hope that you have diversification. Uh, so I think it, it, it's a really good analogy. Good, good work, Derek. All right. That's what we try and do here. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're striving for. All right. So uh, one of the things this kind of leads into, uh, and I'll set you up to, to handle this one, Jay, we just mentioned that sometimes a market is expecting more volatility and there's more juice in the options. And what that means for us is we can get far enough away based upon our rules uh, from a current market that we think makes sense. But with lower volatility, you can't. And I think it brings up the point uh, with a separately managed account strategy where you know, we've got discretion over when we trade, uh, whether we remain in cash for a little bit while we're waiting for something to set up uh, versus an always have to be on strategy. Uh, you know, Jay, recently uh, you as the manager of the strategy, we were in cash or you were in cash for, you know, two and a half weeks or so. Um but you'd rather wait and watch for the rules uh, to set up before taking a trade. Yeah, and it's I th- thanks for bringing this up, Derek, because there are times that uh, when your criteria aren't met, uh, you can't trade. Listen, sometimes the options market just has it wrong, right? They've mispriced risk. Uh, you and I could think of multiple examples of when what the market was prepared for is not what happened. Um, Both ways, whether it's less volatile or more volatile, typically the market uh, leans towards planning for an unexpected event just slightly, meaning there's a little bit of a premium in the options market compared to what actually happens. But they do that because every once in a while they've completely mispriced. And when an event comes, an unexpected event comes, and by event, I mean big market sell-off, not to be unclear, Uh, when that event comes, then they had not priced that risk uh, accurately. And uh, they will have been paid back for the mispricing of what they had before. So, you know, we watch for the market to properly price or misprice uh, uh, risk, especially when it comes to these kind of fast moving, unexpected moves. Uh, and, uh, when, when, when the model says wait, because you're just not getting paid for the risk properly, then you got to wait. Um, someone said this to me the other day, uh, as I was talking about why we've been in cash for so long, I I said, uh, listen, we're waiting for the fat pitch to come across the plate. You know, you don't, you don't want to swing at those that, that you don't need to. Right. And uh, you'll get struck out a lot. Heck, you get hit with the ball if you're not careful. So uh, we want to make sure we don't get hit by the ball. We don't want to pop out. So we want to wait for that fat pitch. And the great thing about this strategy is, um, like you said, you have the discretion when you're running it in what I'll call as, you know, an individual's account, uh, like what you do, like what we do, Derek, uh, you are able to uh, use that type of discretion. And clearly, it's one of those things that we communicate, right? There's um, on average, so surprised that we would have spent two and a half, three, three weeks in cash because it happens on a pretty regular basis. Uh, I don't know the most recent figure on this, but the last time we ran the numbers, we spend on average a hundred days a year in cash. So, you know, that's, that tells you that that's, that includes weekends. So sometimes you're in cash, sometimes you're vested over the weekend, but just generally speaking about a third or a quarter of the time we're in cash and that's okay. Uh, because we're waiting for the, for the position that, we believe is worth taking the risk. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a good way of putting it. I mean, to me, it's like we, 
most of the trades that that are in the strategy are short put spreads, and maybe we'll we'll touch on the volatility skew. I know we don't want to talk about gamma, but maybe I can get volatility skew in, and I'll explain it. But you know, you've uh, puts have this embedded premium in them because most people are buying downside protection, and ever since you know, sort of eighty seven, and so. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's just smart because normally there's some sort of a short term spike in volatility. Which happens after you know a day or two sell off, and so the idea is you want to be this far away. And again, if you're driving, don't do this with what I'm doing with my hands, having them far apart. And maybe it's better just to let the market come down a little bit before doing it. And I think that's that's sort of the intention, but it's also uh, it, you know there's other rules that you know that we apply by too. Yep, yep, you're totally right, and. Um, it's it's you know you have to apply some historical precedents, but also incorporate what the options market is telling you. And so while you're looking at what the I'm not going to say any of the Greek letters, but when you're looking at the metrics within the option pricing themselves, they take a whole bunch of things into consideration. But you also look at ranges of you know frequency. I'll give you a great example. Right, one of the things that uh, we do with our more conservative. Uh, a high probability trade is we make sure, you know, on the put side, for example, you mentioned the puts, you know, we're never closer than 8%. I don't care if it's one day or one week, we just don't get closer than 8% in the, to, uh, to the market. And so why do we do that? It's because not that we think the market can really drop 8% a day. I mean, it can, it has happened before. There's a low chance of that, but it stops us from getting close like 6% or 4% or 3%, even though that's where the risk might be uh, uh, reflected in the options market, you just don't because you don't know when that can go sideways on you. So, um, there's rules like that, that I think are pretty simple, uh, for people to grasp, uh, the other rules around, you know, time and price, the way they, those things line up together gets a little more complicated, but you know, there's some basic things that you can apply to keep yourself out of trouble. You know, one of the things we, we talk about sometimes is how we manage risk and, it's interesting. You know, the short volatility trade became very popular and it, it, it seemed like uh, if you went online, there were chat rooms about how easy it was. You heard about uh, new entrants into the space. Uh, we know that in February of, I guess it was last year, right? Was it last year already? It was 2018, man. Yeah. I mean, it was oh, almost wow. a year and a half ago. So, you know, if, if anybody wants to read up on that volatility apocalypse, uh, Google that and you'll, you'll come up with stuff. But I, I think it's, you know, somebody said to me once, uh, you know, we don't, I, I didn't hire you to, to place the trades. I hired you to, to be disciplined. And I think it's, it's difficult to, to manage the strategy, but it seems a little easier. And I think part of it is, you know, it's, uh, it's not always, you don't always know where, whether volatility is at the right spot or not. You don't know if it's high or low. I'm, I'm saying people who are just you know picking this up. But then also when a trade starts to move against you, often uh, what happens to the pricing and how things actually get traded. Um, I mean, Jay, touch on that aspect if you can. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'll give you, a, I'm going to use another analogy for better or for worse. Um, think about it as when you're selling premium low amounts of premium far away from the market, things that have a low chance of working against you. You're almost like selling lottery tickets, right? You're taking a dollar, but you certainly don't ever want to pay out the lottery, right? We all know the way the lottery works, right? Lots of dollars make it so that the state can, or whomever can fund the payout. But, you know, uh, you never want to pay out on the lottery. You want to sell the tickets, you don't want to pay for it. And so, um, you know, you have to watch as the trade starts to move against you and probabilities start to move against you, sometimes you got to say, you know what, that was it. You got to cry uncle. So the reason why I bring up the lottery tickets is, you know, the odds of, you know, six numbers coming up in a row that that are all, you know, with somebody's number is obviously very, very low. So when you see two balls come up, you don't worry about it. Three balls, you go, oh, three balls in a row. That's That's not bad. Four balls in a row. And now you're going, Okay, well, when you see that fifth ball in a row come up uh, and all your numbers line up, you probably don't want to be holding that ticket anymore, right? And so what ends up happening is you try to offload that that ticket. Now, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't in a fair way, um, but the, you need to have your limits on how much risk you're willing to take. And by the way, that position will reflect the chance that, hey, something that had only, let's say, a 1% chance of working against you now has a 15% chance of working against you. 
you know, that means the position has worked dramatically, moved dramatically against you, right? You thought you had a 99% chance of success. Now you only have an 85% chance of success. Now, while that is still a good number, the market will price that position as such that it'll feel like you're losing money. And you actually have. And if you have to close those positions out, it's going to cost you some money to do that, a lot more than you took in from the lottery ticket that you sold. But the fact that you've sold many, many, many lottery tickets over time, the way the math works out is it should have paid for one or two of these times where you have to cover it. Let's talk a second about market structure, Derek, because I think that's really where you wanted me to go, which is um, – in times of fear, especially when you have a put spread and the market is moving down, you have uh, volatilities working against you, the direction of the market is working against you. Um, in times of fear, the market is definitely less likely to help you exit a position than they were when you got into the position. Um, you, Derek, you like to say spreads widen, right? What that means is the distance between the bid and the ask, the amount to sell or buy, uh, gets very wide. And essentially, while the market makers are forced to give you prices because they're a market maker and that's why they're on that exchange and that's why they're carrying those options, um, you could tell when they don't want to trade it be because they actually widen those bids and asks. And now the market maker is adding on a premium as well. So, you know, one of the things to be careful with with these kinds of strategies is, um, yes, there is the academic research about what the price of an option looks like. But uh, once you're dealing with multiple uh, option leg positions or multiple leg positions in an option strategy, um, you've got this widening of risk that the uh, uh, that the counterparty or the market maker or the hedge funds, whoever you're trading against, will start to put it to the market that they say, well, if you want out, you got to pay because we don't want to get stuck with this thing that you're dropping. Right. So uh, that kind of uh, does that kind of sum up where you're talking about? Sorry, I went on for a little while there, Derek, but did that hit your points? Yeah. I mean, and the other thing too, no, exactly. And, and I think it's a difference in trading in one environment versus another. And the other thing too, that's interesting, while very liquid uh, products, uh, index options is where we sort of live. Um, I do see sometimes people talk about doing this strategy uh, across individual stocks or thinly traded things. And I, sometimes I see, you know, dare I say it, the uh, a newsletter or a chat room recommending a trade. And it's, in reality, the trade would never be able to to get filled uh, because there's just no liquidity. And so uh, there, there's a difference between the reality of running a strategy and the, you know, the, the non-reality. Is that a word? Maybe. Uh, of, <laughs> the of, fantasy? Uh, yeah, of, of doing some of these. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think it goes back to discipline. You know, the other thing too, Jay, I, I've heard is, hey, why not just do short spreads either below the market, or above the market, just on a, a whole bunch of stocks and you know why do it on indexes? Uh, I'll start and you can finish. But I mean, the reality is, when things get really bad, things that are non-correlated tend to correlations tend to go to one, meaning they they become very very highly correlated. We've seen this in August of 2015 and 2007, 2008. Uh, you look at the sectors, you look at different countries, and everything sort of went down at the same time. So it it might help you to a bit. Uh, but I think the reality is uh, indexes are very liquid and at least you can diversify away the single stock risk. Yeah. And um, to add to that, uh, you know, the point of why that correlation starts to occur is the the markets on the other side of your positions don't want to be in anymore, right? They It's easy to recognize when fear is in the market. Maybe it's hard to judge how much fear is there, but it's easy to see it. And they don't want to participate in that market either, right? And so they make it very expensive for you to trade in that market, whatever, you know, whatever the situation is. And so that's why you start to see, you know, when people make the decision, I don't care what it's trading for, just sell it. That kind of mentality causes a ripple effect throughout the rest of the market. And like you said, I don't care if you're diversified between, oh, I've got staples and I've got utilities and I've got energy and I've got tech stocks. I'm diversified. Nope. All stocks are going down when it starts to get really scary because the 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 fear influence on the market becomes very evident and it and it, it takes over and I, you know you and I could name countless times when we've seen it uh, the most recently I'm going to say is Christmas Eve of this year right it was a it was just a silly day when you watched it and you could just tell that people just wanted out. They didn't care what they were getting for their money. Just get me out. This is the, the correction we've all been waiting for. Of course, it wasn't. Uh, and that emotional um, reaction was not right. 
uh, in long in, in in hindsight, but uh, you know, it's just one of those things, Derek. That I agree, diversifying by trying to pick different stocks and 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 even ETFs that may give you a different type of exposure is not nearly as uh, safe as picking a broader index. And guess what? The premium you get for a broader index is less because of that. So the options market knows that as well. It's interesting you mentioned Christmas Eve because I always think that was a really thin, it should have been a thin volatility or, or volume day. And a lot of people were off the, out of the chair, so to speak, from their uh, their desk. You had different people manning the uh, the comm, so to speak. And, uh, you know, I, I, to your point, I mean, a lot of selling that happened that day. And that was actually the most recent lowest low. A lot of that selling was sort of capitulation selling in hindsight. And so that was an interesting day. And, um, you know, there's certain, while we don't call tops and bottoms, uh, that did have all the makings of at least a short-term bottom, in my opinion, but who knows, right? Yeah. Well, that we could get into the algos one other day, right? When the machines, I'm making air quotes, when the <laughs> machines take over, uh, the machines were in charge that day because people were off that day, right? It was in the middle of the week, day before a holiday. It just was one of those things that, uh, you could tell that, you know, it was more programmatic trading, trading than it was, uh, uh, you know, fundamental and, uh, uh, you know, just normal, uh, like you said, normal volume would have definitely prevented the move that we got that day. It's just, it's a great example of what light volume and lack of liquidity uh, can do, coupled with the fear of just get me out. Let's switch gears to really how this balances uh, an overall allocation. I mentioned earlier, maybe 80% hedged equity, 20% short volatility. You've got volatility as an asset class. Of course, it depends on the individual's, uh, you know, circumstances. But I think it's interesting in that, uh, you know, some years, uh, high probability uh, strategy is uh, beats the market. Some years it doesn't. Uh, but the goal is to give somebody an uncorrelated piece that doesn't necessarily need the market to go up. And so I think it's good. Maybe we can spend a little bit of time. And the whole idea of, of short vol is that you're far away from the current market. And so the market can go up, it can go sideways, it can go down. Uh, the risk, of course, it goes too far against uh, the strategy. And by the way, we haven't really talked about uh, why we don't sell calls uh, as often as puts. So really two things there, Jay, if you want to hit. Yeah. So let me start with the, the latter. Um, again, the reason I would sell calls every day if we could, right? If that, if that trade was there, we always take the call trade if it meets our rules. And the reason being is um, uh, typically markets don't gap up 10% in a day or they could gap down 10% in a day. I don't think there's ever an occurrence, Derek, where the market was up 10% in a day. We could look up those facts. I don't think it exists. Um, uh, and so I feel like I almost just quoted the Princess Bride there with the rats of rodents of unusual sizes. I don't think they exist. All right, put put a pin right. in that one. We'll get to that yeah. one later. Um, so calls are just usually you don't get paid for taking the risk, but we'd always prefer to be on the call side of things because uh, you know the gap up, which is your risk when you're selling calls. Uh, the gap up just doesn't isn't there. That black swan event is a lot less likely and a lot less impactful because you probably don't have volatility moving against you too, like you do with your sell puts. Not to mention the things about no backwardation in the options market, the futures market, all those kinds of things don't occur when you're on the call side. So I'd always prefer to sell calls. The problem is you just can't get the premium, meaning you can't get paid for the risk you take, meaning uh, you could lose money on those. I'm not saying you can't lose money on those, but you have to get so close to the market uh, to get the premium that you think you should develop, you should you deserve in the strategy. You just end up taking too much risk, right? The chance of a two or three percent update is always out there. You don't want to be too close. Okay, that was the that was the second. The first one you talked a little bit about, I think, allocating and how to use them in a portfolio. Correct. No, that's right. Yeah. And so for us, like you said before, we've kicked around the 60-40 portfolio. I feel like we're like we've kicked it into the the dirt where, where it and, belongs. And beyond. And beyond, Jay. <laughs> and beyond. <laughs> um, and so and, and the reason is a 60-40 portfolio is designed to, designed to give you diversification. Well, if you're running a hedged equity portfolio, you don't need that diversification. You've already limited and managed your risk. Great. We talked about that last time. Uh, so what do you do with that other 20%? Well, running a strategy that is designed to generate returns in uh, whether the stock market is up or down or whether the bond market is up or down is important. Now, I'm not saying the strategy can't lose money. 
of course, any strategy can lose money besides, uh, I guess, treasuries, if you're going to hold them to maturity. Besides that, that's that's what's considered the riskless investment these days. And you'll make your whopping 1.8% in a two-year period. But uh, if you are uh, looking for something, and we believe you should be looking for something that is designed to generate returns, not correlated to what the market is doing, whether it's stocks or bonds, this is why you allocate this to a portfolio. You you said it a minute ago, right? Some years it beats the market, some years it doesn't. But the consistent returns um, that you get independent of what the stock market is doing is what's desirable about this strategy. And historically speaking, it's done well. Yeah. You know, on, one more thing too on the calls. Uh, I used to, you know, we everybody knows what black swan risk is. Well, I think everybody knows, but it's, it's the risk of something unlikely, unforeseen, uh, not expected happening. And, and I believe the story was the explorer's, uh, in Antarctica, uh, and the internet told me this, so it's got to be true. But uh, explorers were in an article; they believe that only swans, uh, swans could be white feathers, and then they saw a black swan, and it was a black swan event, right? I think That's they were in the, Australia, not Antarctica, but I think you're close. Did maybe they went there after? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I don't, <laughs> but I actually call uh, the risk on the call side. Uh, selling calls too close, white swan volatility, meaning everybody, it's it's all in front of you. But how often have we seen strategies? And by the way, selling calls is not hedging. It's only bringing in a little bit of income. But I think more often than not, it, it can cut into upside potential by selling calls too close because markets have exceeded. You know, To your point, Jay, the, the calls, especially with where interest rates are, they just don't pay a lot in premium. And there's that volatility skew where the, the puts are worth more and the puts further away actually have value. You know, Nobody's buying a $4,000 call right now, uh, 4,000 S&P call. But you might see, uh, you might have people buying $2,000 level uh, S&P puts. So uh, it's just a little bit different on the pricing there. Yep. And, and it, it, um, it has changed. The environment has changed for that too. Uh, we saw the change start in 2014 and really uh, make itself evident in 2015 that um, you see more and more institutions are forced to hedge their books from large market volatility movements. And not one day, not one week, not one month, but year-long types of sell-offs. Um, after Dodd-Frank was uh, uh, instituted, uh, that regulation actually forced the banks to manage their risk even tighter. And you would think that's a good thing, but what does that do? That means the banks are actually now in the market buying options. Um, more frequently than not, when we are placing a trade in, say, the S&P 500, we're selling against the bank. Uh, I think the most recent position we put on was uh, Barclays was on the other side of most of our position. And so um, what's happening is those institutions are forced to take positions of long puts or protective positions. And it does continue to create that skew between the pricing on the put side, when more people buy it, the price goes up, then the pricing on the call side. Nobody's forced to buy calls in the market, right? So uh, not unless they're short in the bank, and that's very, very unlikely. So, um, you know, that 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 market force, that regulation that has pushed the, the larger institutions into the put side of the market um, will not only put prices higher, but it'll also cause prices to spike when other triggers start to occur. So, you know, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, maybe they're not fully hedged on a normal day and then things start to get a little nasty and they got to put more of a hedge on. And then when they get really nasty, they got to put a bigger hedge on. And so all of that prolificates itself and builds on itself because of the regulation. So, you know, you went into the, hey, some, there, by the way, there are plenty of 2,000 strike puts being bought in the market on the S&P, right? You're, you're totally right. And it has to do with institutions that say, well, at least we'll limit our risk to, you know, 33% down from here, that kind of stuff. You've almost backed into, uh, you know, we started off talking about implied volatility, but what's interesting about what you said with, with the banks and hedging, you know, a lot of uh, investment firms, they might calculate what's called a value at risk. And value at risk is a simple way. Uh, maybe it's not so simple, but it, it's kind of saying, okay, if the market, uh, let's say we have a 2% probability of, and I'm, I'm pulling this out of memory, right? So it, it could be 1%, could be 2%. But let's say there's a 1% or 2% probability of the market going down as much as it went down in 2008. And by the way, when you're running probabilities, all you're doing is looking at historical uh, annualized returns and you're building a probability model. Okay. So you say, okay, 
so if I have a hundred million dollars uh, and a, I have a two percent probability of losing thirty eight percent of that, or uh, what is that? Thirty eight million dollars, right? And so uh, the banks may say, okay, well maybe I want to cut my value at risk if the market does something at different probability levels. So they buy some protection. And by the way, as you said, because other people, you know, that's a question too. Like, who would buy these things if they're so far away? Well. People are reducing their value at risk. What's fascinating that you said too is my suspicion is that when volatility spikes, if they are using a dynamic probability model, volatility spiking makes it more likely that markets get to a level and hence your point that it sort of feeds on itself. They have to buy more protection at inflated levels. Uh, I got a little bit complicated, but it it was kind of interesting um, to think about it that way. Yep. And it's, it's, uh, you know, the market is an evolving, uh, animal and, um, things like regulation and, uh, interest rates. I mean, heck we, we could probably do another podcast about interest rates, although that's, that's more your, uh, your lane there, bro. but, uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> all of those things, uh, uh, are, are, you know, go into the market and help adjust the prices. And you just, you need to be a student of the market, especially when you're managing these kinds of strategies. Yeah. I'm writing it right down interest rates and options, because we do have stuff to talk about. And that actually leads into the value of calls. Uh, maybe instead of doing next week's episode, all about gamma, maybe we'll do uh, something <laughs> on interest rates. We're, we're not, we're for not the doing insomniacs. Is that, is that who that one's for? <laughs> All right. Well, I think this is, we've taken this as far as we can. I think this is a good discussion. We hit a lot of areas, but you know, you and I get questions often about not only, you know, how you pick your spots, how come sometimes you wait in cash, sometimes you go directly to a new trade and who is on the other side of these trades. I think we answered a lot of the questions that we get. And by the way, we like questions, keep uh, sending emails to JRI and, uh, if you have a topic that you want us to cover in, in a future episode, by all means do. So Jay, you're saying we're not doing Gamma next week. I, I, I'm just going to advise against it just slightly. All right. All right. One of these days I'll get it in there. Jay, thanks again for coming on. For everyone else, we'll, uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks. Thanks.